Good morning from the headquarters of the Institute of Risk Management here in London and welcome to our webinar to introduce our new digital risk management certificate. We've got over 250 people signed up to join us today from around the world and we're delighted to have a chance to speak to you all. My name is Carolyn Williams. I'm the Director of Corporate Relations here at IRM. I've also got with me here in London Trudy Mellon, who's a specialist educational consultant who's been working with us on the development and delivery of the qualification, and James McCarthy. James is our Student Admissions Engagement and Support Manager and the first point of contact for all our students. I've also got on the line three senior risk professionals, Steve Trees from NHS Digital, Steve O'Neill from Barclays, and Stefano Capodagli a senior strategic risk advisor and a past banking CRO, all of whom are going to give us their views on digital developments. Good morning, everybody. First, some housekeeping matters. If you get some problems with the sound during the webinar, then I'm afraid it is most likely to be a problem with your internet connection, and there's nothing that we can actually do here to fix it. However, the webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again, and if there's anything you miss. If you've got any questions as you go along, then please type them in and we'll do our best to answer them, either as we go or at the end as time permits. So let's take a look at the agenda for our session today. First of all, I'm going to take you through the background to this new qualification. Then we're going to have a discussion around some of the big issues in digital development and how they're going to affect risk professionals. And then we're going to look at the details of the new qualification, how we develop the syllabus, some practical information about how to enroll, how the qualification is going to work. Now, some of you listening are already members of IRM, but some of you may not have studied with us before. So let's start with a quick introduction. The Institute of Risk Management is one of the primary global educators for the risk management profession. We've got over 6,500 members worldwide in over 100 countries. Every year, we've got about 500 students studying, taking exams with us. We're independent, owned and run by our members, and not-for-profit. Any surplus we make gets plowed right back into developing new educational and training products. We were formed about 30 years ago um, in order to provide a master's level distance learning diploma in risk management, which we still do. And about 10 years ago, we added a shorter qualification, our International Certificate in Risk Management, to the diploma. Subsequently, we added a financial services version of the certificate to reflect the special risk environment of the banking and insurance industries. Many of you joining us today may have studied one of these qualifications and may have achieved or be working towards certified risk professional status as evidence of your professional knowledge. All our qualifications are distance learning. We provide full support to students studying around the world, typically part-time while in work. And because we are a membership organization, Ongoing membership provides all the lifelong learning and networking benefits you'd expect to support you in your career. Many of the world's largest organizations support their employees to study with us. As well as providing our distance learning qualifications, we also run risk management training programs, short face-to-face -face programs, either provided on a public basis or we go in-house and run tailored programs for particular organizations. Our core subject is risk management in its most comprehensive sense. We're sector independent. All organizations, whatever their area of business, whether they're private, public, or third sector, need qualified risk professionals, knowledgeable about the tools and techniques of modern risk management. So on to our new qualification, a certificate in digital risk management. Where did this idea come from and why? Over the past two years, IRM has conducted two major pieces of research into the future of the profession. The first was our own risk agenda research that marked IRM's 30th year of operation. We asked our members and contacts around the world how they saw the profession developing. Additionally, we've also been working over the past year for the, with the Centre for Risk Studies at the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge. They've undertaken a piece of academic research for us looking at the risk management perspectives of global corporates. Both these reports can be downloaded from our website if you want to read more. But most importantly, they also took us to similar conclusions. The rapid pace of digital technology is driving big changes for individuals, organizations, and societies, offering new opportunities and risks. 
and risk professionals need to keep abreast of these changes if they are to continue to help their organizations take the right risks safely. We are talking about the impact of technology on business models, the changes that digitalization, big data and the ubiquity of mobile devices has already had on industries from the music to taxis. We are talking about the spread of sensors linking to the Internet, the Internet of Things and the impact that that could have. And we're thinking of the more, more emerging general purpose technologies like blockchain and artificial intelligence that will offer further opportunities and risks. Risk professionals have to be able to respond knowledgeably and positively to these challenges, and that's why we've developed this new qualification. It's a relatively quick qualification to obtain, and will provide you with a great grounding in these new technologies and their business impact. It will explain how to approach risk assessment and other aspects of a systematic approach to risk management within a digital context, and also provide a good grounding in modern risk-based cybersecurity. Holding this certificate will build on the risk management knowledge you should already have and give you the confidence and knowledge to add real value to your organization's digital future. So let's now talk to our panel members that we have here today. Each of them is going to spend a couple of minutes giving their views on how organizations should be responding to digitalization. First, I'm going to turn to Steve Trees. Steve is a long-standing fellow of the IRM and head of corporate risk for NHS Digital here in the UK. NHS Digital is the national provider of information, data, and IT infrastructure systems for the UK's public health and social care system. Steve's also an elected public governor for Harrogate and District NHS Foundation Trust. Steve, would you like to give us your take on the key areas of digital risk for the health and care system and for public bodies in general? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Carolyn. Um, I think one of the big areas of risk is actually not taking full advantage of the uh, use of data and digitization uh, and improving well, I'm focusing on health and care, but the public sector generally. Um, I think the other areas are risk I have in mind apply equally to the whole of the public sector. So uh, risks around a lack of public trust in data uh, sharing, uh, which could be contributed by another area of risk, data loss or a, a, a breach of uh, people's privacy. Um, Statutory and regulatory compliance, because we will we'll all know the uh, GDPR uh, very well, so we, we are complying with that. Our own Data Protection Act has been changed to align with GDPR, but we have to think how we maintain continuing compliance, in, including, uh, dare I say, in a post-Brexit uh, environment. Um, and I think another particular area of risk in health and social care is that, you know, whilst there are risks around not taking full advantage of digitization. We have to be aware there's a risk around the capacity of the system, uh, and I'm thinking particularly the health system, to implement digital change along with the, all the other things um, people in the health system have to, have to deal with, which I think you'll all have seen, uh, certainly those of you who are based in the UK, you'll all have seen probably every day uh, in your newspapers and on television and on the internet. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that point, uh, but they're the five key areas of risk I see at the moment. Thanks, Steve. And now on to another Steve. Steve O'Neill is head of the Risk Academy for Barclays. The Risk Academy is the internal global learning hub that supports the development of risk professionals across, across the banking group. IRM is pleased to work closely with Barclays over several years on their education and training programs. So Steve. What, from the point of view of the banking and financial services sector, what are the key areas of risk for you? Uh, thanks, Colin. Yes, there's, there are a number of, of areas, and uh, like uh, Steve was just talking there in terms of uh, the, the health service, um, data uh, and protecting data is a real big concern for, for banks. Um, the issue around uh, reputational risk and, uh, and operational risk really are so closely linked and uh, and if uh, a bank loses uh, any of its data we've had uh, data outages we've had uh, data go missing um, it immediately puts a, um, a question mark against the the bank and indeed the financial services uh, 
a system in general. A couple of things that, that uh, have come out recently is around um, the, the loss of data. I mean, Barclays have lost data, other banks have lost data, which has potentially been a, a risk for, for us. Um, also, uh, around uh, the regulator, uh, all, all um, industry segments now are, are seeing a greater impact and, and influence from the regulator in trying to uh, ensure that uh, uh, the risk around uh, uh, digital is recognized. Indeed, we've had uh, the Bank of England have been testing the UK's ability to withstand uh, cyber attacks uh, on financial institutions. Uh, some 40 firms have been involved in uh, war, what they call wargaming exercises to assess their resilience. And uh, the fears that the bank has is that um, if one, one bank's system, uh, systems fail for paying for goods and services uh, and interbank payments, then that could have uh, a ripple effect throughout the rest of, uh, of the industry. Uh, and also uh, the number of um, attacks uh, that uh, the financial institutions are seeing from, from cyber uh, criminals they're up this year by about 18%, and uh, technology outages are, caught, are increased by 138% so far this year. So there's lots of, uh, of concerns there. And then also fraud risk is something that uh, we're, we're particularly uh, concerned about in Barclays, uh, as are the other banks, and we spend a lot of our time educating our clients and customers of the uh, impact of potential cyber risks, whilst at the same time taking uh, a lot of time to uh, make sure that we have our systems in place to protect uh, our infrastructure and make sure that uh, our customers' uh, data and uh, their ability to, uh, to be confident in using things like online banking uh, applications on their phones, uh, online banking apps uh, through their uh, other devices, that they're fit for purpose. Uh, and certainly that's the sort of thing that we're spending a lot of time concentrating on at the moment. So that's just to give you a bit of a flavor there in terms of uh, what, we, what we're looking at in the banking uh, system. Thanks, Steve. And finally, not another Steve, but a Stefano. Stefano Capodaglia, who's joining us from Rome this morning. Stefano is a strategic risk advisor and has been a CRO in the past in the banking sector. Stefano, uh, what of these issues do you think that risk professionals should be most aware of? Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Um, in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, billionaire businesses are successfully starting up and uh, growing simply by aggregating goods or services from different sources into a single platform. At the same time, digital technology is reshaping the way of doing business during the digital era. Artificial intelligence is transforming workplaces, productivity, blockchains are radically simplifying banking transactions, while the Internet of Things is changing how to gather and analyze data. Business models saw so, and the technologies have been changing and evolving in the last decade of digitization, so doing the associated risks. A similar business process in private sector companies, financial institutions, and government have become digital at an accelerated pace in the past few years. In most sectors, I see several functions that were handled manually are now being semi-automated and automated, as uh, my, my, my colleague was saying before. While this phenomenon has drive a dramatic improvement in productivity, it has definitely originated new risk factors. So risk management, I can see, besides continuing uh, being a trusted advisor board and managing risk appetite and, and developing frameworks, is now shall, I would say, now swiftly evolve to a digital risk management uh, and, and looking at enterprise risk and security in more uh, details. Building digital resiliency to me, both in terms of strategy, framework, and organization, process, and operation, and system, it's the new mission of risk management. At all levels, should be detecting threats and responding to events that mitigate, minimize financial losses and business disruption. Uh, risk managers is really a, a privileged position. We not only manage and mitigate emerging risk, but also help the business to take advantages of the upside opportunities for innovation and growth. It, this is a real chance for risk to be a strategic risk asset. 
in summary, to respond to, to, respond to the digital future, uh, I see risk management evolution, uh, uh, keeping the pace of the digital era, uh, risk management being a digital innovator and facilitator of business enabling, and a custodian of organizational digital evolution in its enterprise-wide risk ma management framework through risk analytics and artificial intelligence, also anticipating digital value creation and downside. And last but not least, shall strategically build risk-optimized digital resiliency. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. I mean, that's a very exciting mission for the risk management profession going forward. Um, I wonder if I can ask um, Steve from Barclays, um, are you actually finding it hard to recruit people who've got the right skills to be able to do this sort of thing, both risk management and their knowledge about technology and digital disruption? That's a, a good question. And um, I think um, being in banking where management of risk is our primary activity, um, recruiting people with the right risk management skills doesn't necessarily present the major problems. However, I would counter that by saying um, we need to have people who are um, aware of the, the digital um, environment in which we're, we're operating, uh, not only recognize the opportunities that Stefano mentioned there, but also make sure that they have the awareness to think about the broad uh, risk implications of everything that we do. So um, we're certainly seeing uh, uh, colleagues joining us who uh, are aware of, of risk and have that technical uh, understanding, but actually it's really keeping up to date with the changes. You know, we think it's only a couple of years where things like Bitcoin and blockchain weren't even uh, mentioned, and now they're seen as uh, uh, potential uh, enablers, but also high risk for um, banks particularly. And, and so it's something that we, we need to be mindful of uh, moving forward. Yes, I think there's, I mean, there's a question that's come through to us here, which is basically asking, is this a, the course that we're offering, is it a technical course, or is it more about the, the assurance side of things? And I think one thing that we were trying to focus on is that um, this is not a, a detailed technical course in the sense that you will learn how to do penetration testing or anything like that. But what we're aiming to do is provide people with the knowledge to be able to talk to technical experts from a position of confidence and knowledge. So they are aware of the, the key issues that are, that are taking place um, and they, they have a strong foundation of knowledge um, and can ask the right questions. So, I mean, Steve Treese, um, what, what do you think from the point of view of the um, NHS and, and the public sector? Um, are you getting the right people coming forward with the right skills there? Uh, well, I think um, with, with those, it's, um, uh, I guess, uh, elements of what Steve has just said as well. It's making sure that uh, we, we have people with the right, I'm, I'm talking generally, not just about risk management, but people having the right digital skills to take, understand and take advantage of new areas of technology like artificial intelligence uh, and, and so on. And uh, one of the advantages that I see of this particular certificate is people in um, risk functions being able to talk the same language as, as those people as well um, because terminology of vocabulary communication language is, uh, is vital to this. We need to be able to understand what they're looking to deliver so we can understand what the key opportunities and risks are, but equally um, we need to be able to make sure that they um, are thinking about risk and opportunity in an appropriately balanced way, because uh, I suspect there might be a tendency to, uh, uh, to focus on uh, the great shiny new piece of uh, innovation, uh, and that's not to say we should slow those things down, but actually understand in balance those, those risks and opportunities. Um, but in terms of technical skills across the business, we, we, you know, we do have challenges in recruiting people generally in the, in the public sector because clearly there's a lot of competition for those types of skills. Yes, well, we're hoping that uh, qualification like this will make um, our people very uh, marketable in the, in the jobs market. Um, we've got a question that's come through that I'd like to, to push towards um, Stefano. Um, yeah. Somebody is asking, 
do we need to have more agile enterprise risk frameworks that explicitly call out cyber risk as well as information security? And I think this links with something that I sort of thought about, with that saying that cyber security is a, is a very important part of digital risk, but is it sufficiently integrated with the whole risk management process, or is it being dealt with in technical silos? No, indeed. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a very interesting question, and I can mention that uh, basically, uh, on uh, recent research, I've been working on the studying and uh, advising institutions. Uh, basically, the cybersecurity incidents struck in 2017 uh, are now the hitting the new record, and basically are ranked as the first in U.S. and U.K. as the first priority for banks and credit unions. So, I would say really that uh, cyber risk shall be definitely integrated into the enterprise risk management and in the risk appetite. Uh, as all uh, other enterprise risks. At the same time, I would say, that, yes, I see a dynamic. What I want to uh, stress is the holistic approach. And this is also, I would mention, in relation to the skills that we are, we are expecting, we are requiring. I'm advising, as I said, CROs, uh, C, um, uh, CEOs on, uh, on this part. We need digital risk skills, but we need to have holistic uh, mindset. And so in that respect, for it, this is exactly for managing swiftly and dynamically the enterprise risk management and covering digital, cyber, and all technological risks. Would either of the other two, Steve, like to make a comment about the integration of cyber, uh, information security, and risk management in their organizations? Uh, yeah, Steve O'Neill here. I've, I think uh, uh, Stefano makes a really good point. Um, one of the things, uh, and this may de demonstrate how we do need to be integrated, um, in Barclays uh, we have uh, encouraged uh, so much you know, to ensure that we have potential uh, barriers to uh, block cyber attacks. And the better we get at that, then the um, cyber criminals will adopt a more simplified approach, and we're seeing a lot of our vulnerable customers contacted uh, by telephone, um, by, by criminals purporting to be police, um, you know, uh, the bank's internal security advisors, and encouraging them to um, basically take money out of their bank accounts and move them to an account that uh, the police have uh, opened uh, in another bank. And so we're making sure that uh, whenever customers come in to ask us to transfer money to uh, another organization, that we, we just ask that extra question just to understand uh, what the issues are. And it's just, again, raising awareness of the potential risk because once the money leaves the bank account in, in Barclays and goes to another account, it's very difficult to, to recover it. And so we just need to be aware of not only digital risks but more, you know, less sophisticated risks as well. I can, think I add, actually, uh, Caroline, yeah. can I add, Caroline, uh, can I add a very good point? Uh, yeah. th I, wa I wanted to mention third-party risks as emerging very important risk in the context of digitalization. Yes, very much so. And I think um, uh, IRM um, focuses on the extended enterprise as the context within which we should be looking at risk. And I think from Barclays' point of view, you've actually been training your customers as well, haven't you, Steve? Um, the, the sort of dig digital eagles project, yes, um, and trying to extend competence in um, tackling cyber fraud out beyond the, the realms of the staff of the bank, out, out to the customers as well. Yeah, we we hold um, sessions, lunch and learn sessions for customers in branches. We've run a successful um, TV advertising campaign, raising awareness of uh, the importance of not divulging your. Uh, PIN number and things like that. So we're definitely uh, trying to be on the front, front foot to support uh, the general public in improving their digital skills as well. Okay, moving on from, from cyber issues, um, what about something like artificial intelligence? Um, if some bright spark in your organization came up with an idea to apply an artificial intelligence solution or a, a blockchain solution to um, an issue that you might have, do you think that you know, the risk teams in the organization are uh, currently equipped to deal with that? Anybody like to comment on that? I can comment. Uh, uh -huh. 
if you if you if you may um, yes artificial intelligence uh, I, I'm working on a project and I think uh, it's interesting to touch upon it, the imp the possibility to apply artificial intelligence to uh, assess uh, for example I mean we are implementing this on assessing credit risk uh, uh, credit risk uh, for uh, small and medium enterprises so using uh, the possi uh, having the possibility to interface inter um, acquire uh, uh, a huge amount of information uh, from different sources cross checking so having a, 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 a much more wider source of information to assess uh, the the basically the borrower risk uh, this is applied, and so artificial intelligence help in this sense to 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 um, optimize the time, but also improve the quality of the uh, assessment. Thank you, and um, Steve Treese, um, any sign of um, blockchain solutions or artificial intelligence within the health service and public sector? Uh, well. Yes, there, 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 there is, but in, in terms of your earlier question about um, whether there's enough uh, understanding of those technologies from a risk perspective, I, I would say there's a way that we, um, that we, need, that we need to go there. Um, picking up on the earlier conversation as well, uh, we, we do a lot of uh, work with the health and social care system, so people in, in trusts and so on, to improve their awareness um, of cyber risk as we were discussing earlier but al also uh, trying to offer our support to trusts and so on uh, when they're doing a technological innovation uh, but, uh, but I think artificial intelligence is uh, obviously a, c a coming thing and there's probably more that we need to need to do there um, the, the interesting thing is uh, working as we've touched on earlier with our supply chain as, w as well um, I think, as you said earlier, Carolyn, that uh, it's uh, it's important to think about the extended enterprise as well. But in, in terms of the specific question about artificial intelligence, um, I think it's something more we could uh, that, that that we could do to understand from a risk perspective. Uh, blockchain is is probably personally a little bit of a um, an interesting but not very well known uh, system. For want, of, for want of a better word. So, yeah, we, we need to understand more, I would say, in the health system. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've got a, a question that's come through that is looking at um, the three lines of defence model. And um, the question says, in the UK and Ireland, there's recent, recently been a push for a first line business information security officer role to provide assurance that the second line, presumably the risk management team, have been managing and overseeing information security and digital cyber risk appropriately. And the questioner is suggesting this turns the traditional three pillars on its head. Um, how is this being approached by organizations to provide a consistent approach and framework? Any tips? Has anybody yet got any um, comments on the use of three lines of defense model in the context of digital? Uh, I, I'd, I'd say we very much look at it in what might be seen as more of a traditional view. So actually it would be more the risk management function and the cyber function and so on, having a look at what, at what the first line of defence yeah. were doing and, and, and seeing whether that was uh, sufficient and whether we were giving, uh, acquiring enough uh, assurance there. But we very much do follow the three lines of defence model, but in the more traditional way. Mm -hmm. Stefano, have yeah. you any views on three lines of defence? I think that the, um, the question, the the, the the subject was mentioned, is related to the higher um, responsibility to the first line in terms of risk ownership. The first line, as a matter of fact, is the risk owner, and uh, in an ideal world, the second line should even not exist. I would, uh, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but I would say the first line could, should be able to, to assess the risk properly and eventually uh, anticipating even the risks. So in that respect, I think in the digital era, because of the um, uh, enhancement, because of the, uh, so the help, the assistance that we receive from machine learning and from artificial intelligence, I would say that there is a much more work of control that the first line can do because the operational work is 
done by the by the robots or by the artificial intelligence. So this is, I think, is in that respect how uh, how the first and second line. Not that the second line should not anymore uh, be relevant, but uh, with the, with the much higher. And as I insist, uh, it should be more forward looking. Should be more looking dynamically and doing a scenario a stress test more, more in terms of preparing the organization to uh, eventually unexpected events uh, and having the capital uh, available for, a, for eventually any crisis, uh, idiosyncratic or systemic. So this is the, the, the a bit of a reshaping of internally the first and second line of defense. But I don't see the, 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 the revolution, let me say, of the, the, the line of defense. This should stay in place. And eventually the, even the third line as assurance could enhance and uh, adopting the, with the digital would announce that the work and uh, become as well less exposed, let's say, and more uh, ex ante. And we have a supplementary question in this area, which is bringing in the question of the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer's team. Um, is that first line? Is it second line? Or somebody said it could be, is it the one and a half line of defense? Um, are we sort of fragmenting the defenses here? Mm. Is it for me? Uh, sorry. No, no, carry on, Stefano. I'll come in afterwards. No, I disagree. No, I don't think we have, we could start starting segmenting. Then we have, we have what the first and a half and the second and a half. I think it's it's a matter of uh, clarifying responsibilities and uh, understanding well who is owning the risk, who is the one. The, 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 the as I mentioned, the custodian. Okay, the, I, I would use this word as clear. Custodian is different. So, uh, in that respect, but I again stress the, the importance of the dynamic approach in both respect. Thank you. Um, Steve O'Neill, one last question for you that's come up on, on um, the list here. Um, somebody's asking, what would be the risk factors in respect of new digital payment methods? So I think we're looking at um, uh, Possibly, um, you know, cryptocurrencies, that sort of thing, or even uh, you know, other methods. I mean, is that something that Barclays is looking at? So, you know, new methods of payment and, and a risk approach to that? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, it's, it's a difficult question to to answer because um, quite often these things uh, r develop so quickly. Uh, so, I, I think um, the if I could just give you an example where we're having to work um, cross banks. Uh, is the the uh, open banking environment? Uh, so it's not necessarily the the payment, but it's actually giving uh, an individual opportunities to look at his banking um, arrangements across multiple banks using one application, uh, and all the banks are working towards this aim of uh, being totally transparent and enabling uh, transactions to take place between banks at speed. Uh, and so you can actually see everything as an individual customer across different uh, bank platforms. But certainly uh, we need to be mindful of all the, the new uh, opportunities and risks that link to things like cryptocurrencies because uh, you know, it, it's a non-regulated um, environment at the moment and uh, it's so easy to um, get um, uh, drawn into the opportunities without considering the, the wider risks. Uh, would, would be my uh, observation there. Yeah, and I think a good knowledge of what's actually going on is probably a first step, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for our panel. We'll, we'll draw that part of our webinar to a close now. So thank you, Steve and Steve and Stefano, for contributing. Um, perhaps if you stay on the line, because some people might um, have some more questions as we go on, and we, we can come back to that if we've got time at the end. But I'm now going to switch around to talking more about the practicalities of the uh, new qualification, how it, it um, has come together and how it's going to work. So I'm now going to introduce um, not, not another Steve, but uh, Trudy, Trudy Mellon, who is a specialist consultant working here at IRM. Um, and Trudy has really been our key person taking this certificate from its very conception about a year ago to the launch position now today. So Trudy, can you tell us something about that process and um, you know, the, the, what you've been doing on, on um, working with Warwick? Yes, thank you, Carolyn. Um, well, first of all, why did um, IRM decide to work in partnership with the University of Warwick to develop the qualification in digital risk management? 
Um, well, this is really because they are leading academics in, their, in this field of uh, cyber security and business ethics. And this means that the qualification combines the academic excellence that we get from Warwick experts with the practical risk management experience that we have gained from working with our members. Um, who come from different sectors of business, such as banking, insurance, and the public sector, and work in key roles such as operations, IT, audit, and compliance. And we believe that this will give individuals the skills and knowledge required in this important area. Um, so regarding the syllabus development, um, first of all, it was designed as a standalone qualification to complement our other qualifications. It's suitable for anyone looking to develop an understanding of risk management in a digital era and can be used by existing IRM members to top up knowledge for continuous professional development or as an introduction to the subject for those directly or indirectly related to risk management. The qualification introduces learners to digital disruption and cybersecurity risks and provides an understanding of the tools and techniques to use to help business stay protected. The syllabus is broken down into six units which identify the topics and learning outcomes of the qualification. Students will need to spend around 20 to 30 hours studying each unit. They'll receive a study guide which explains how to study and provides learning activities and self-assessment questions for the student to test themselves against as they progress through the course. And students will be assessed by examination against the learning outcomes of the syllabus at the end of the course with successful students receiving a completion certificate awarded by IRM. So what does the qualification cover and what is it designed to do? So the syllabus learning outcomes are designed to help the student identify what they should be able to do at the end of the course. And the main topics and learning outcomes are as follows. So Unit 1 provides an overview of the digital world and the fourth industrial revolution. And after studying this unit, students should be able to demonstrate a broad understanding of today's most important technological developments, such as blockchain, and how digital technology is changing everything, including the way we work and relate to one another. Unit 2 explains digital disruption, organizational, and societal change. It explains the risks and opportunities associated with digital technology, including the ethical implications of digital innovation and artificial intelligence. It will discuss general risk management principles and practices and the risk frameworks relevant to managing digital risk. Unit 3 relates to digitization risk and cybersecurity risk. It explains the difference between these two kinds of digital risk and the key cyber threats and basic disciplines of cybersecurity. Unit 4 relates to digital risk management approaches and security. It explains how security by design can identify, classify, and protect valuable information assets and the actions that can be taken to reduce the risks arising from human factors. Uh, unit 5 helps students to understand attack and defense methods and frameworks. It examines the motivations and capabilities of the threat actors fighting the cybersecurity cold war and explains how a risk management system can manage multiple digital risks, providing examples of tools and techniques to achieve this. Unit 6 discusses governance, incident management, and reporting. It discusses governance of digital risk and how the techniques discussed in this course integrate in align with business objectives such as best practice approaches to incident management and how to apply the principles of audit and assurance to digital risk. The full syllabus can be downloaded from our website to gain a better understanding of the topics and learning outcomes covered. And we believe training and education of risk managers of digital disruption, cyber risk, and the impact of technological changes is central to the future offering from the IRM. And we'll be introducing further products and services in these areas to support learners and risk management professionals in their future careers. Thank you, Trudy. 
Okay, I'm now going to hand over to James McCarthy. Um, James is the person here in the IRM office who deals with um, all the um, enrollments and inquiries from students, um, both on the, uh, our existing uh, enterprise risk management courses, but also on the new digital one. So, James, would you like to take us through the actual practicalities of what people are going to find if they want to enroll on this course? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Karen. So, um, I will be running through some of the practicalities um, of enrolling onto the course and provide some further um, general information um, and sort of expand on some of the points that Trudy's, Trudy's covered already. Um, so, the enrollments are currently open. Um, they opened on the 3rd of December. Um, and we will remain open until the 28th of February 2019. And this relates specifically to the uh, November 2019 exam session, um, for which we have a special introductory price, which is displayed there on, on that slide. Uh, we give a guideline study time of around 200 hours for the qualification um, in its entirety. Uh, but this could be lower or higher slightly, depending on your current knowledge. Uh, an understanding of the subject areas uh, that are covered within within the course syllabus. Enrollments will need to be completed online using the online enrollment form which is available on our website. Um, so that can be accessed um, now. It's, it's up and running as we speak. Um, and as mentioned, the course fee is an introductory rate at £995. Uh, the fee will include everything displayed on the slide there under the What's Included heading. Um, from the exam fees to study guides and all of the supporting documents that you will need to get through your studies. We have the question about um, will there be an online community for students to discuss the course, and I think you've got there on your slide that there will be a discussion forum. Yeah, absolutely. There. So the answer so the, is yes. The on discussion that forum would, would be available to all students. Um, uh, once uh, you're enrolled, the, the, the students will be issued with a reading list. Uh, which will include the, the core textbook titles and all of the details uh, required to get those. Students will be required to purchase the two core textbooks separately to the course fee, um, and these will be available to purchase in either printed copies, uh, which are around £25 for both of the books, or ebook copies, which are around £15 for, for both of those. So looking a bit more at the support available, um, the next slide highlights uh, some of these services and tools that we offer. Uh, the study guide is the key document to really guide and drive your studies um, and to point you in the right direction. And we'll work through the learning aims and outcomes of the, of the modules and direct you to the right parts of the uh, essential readings and the core textbooks at the right time. Um, so you really are directed, um, although it's a self-study course, a, a distance learning course, you will be directed um, fully to make sure that you're, you're covering all of the essential uh, aims and outcomes of the qualification. Uh, student support shown there um, by email, by telephone to the student support team here at the IRM, uh, but also through that discussion forum that we touched upon in the, in the last slide, uh, where you will also be able to interact with peers and other colleagues um, studying the qualification, uh, as well as the qualification coach who will be um, initially moderating that forum and um, checking interactions that are happening uh, and stepping in at the right time, but also um, facilitating discussion and uh, supplying you with information that may be relevant or news stories that may be relevant to uh, the qualification as and when they arise. Uh, the coach will also be running uh, online tutorials, which you can see there in the last box, uh, which are provided as a webinar such as this, um, which you'll have access to um, either through the live broadcast or for the recordings of those um, to access um, as many times as you like and whenever you like. So then finally, looking at the exams, um, the Digital Risk Certificate exam is a computer-based multiple choice exam, um, and it's a 90-minute assessment. Uh, exams will be attended in person, um, so you will be choosing an exam centre to, to attend in person to sit those exams or that exam. Uh, exam centres will be available through, throughout the world, um, and details of how to book your chosen centre will be made available to you once you are on programme. Um, so there's nothing to do initially. You will be contacted once you've begun your studies to, um, to, to determine how you book those uh, exam centres. Uh, if you were unsuccessful in, any, in, in your exam, you will have the opportunity to um, resit uh, the exam at a later date. You'll have two further attempts to do those. Um, and again, once exam results are released, you'll be given information on how to do that. Uh, but information on that will also be uh, in the student handbook as well. 
anyone who thinks that they may need any kind of uh, special arrangements or considerations for the exam um, to be put in place, uh, you can find details of that on our website as well. So if you needed some extra time, for example, uh, for any learning difficulty you may have, then all of the details on, on what applies and how to apply for that can be found on the IRM website. Uh, so hopefully that's given you um, some information that's useful to you. Um, and now's the time for any questions. I think if you have any, um, it could be on any of the information that we've been through as, as a collection um, or to ask anything that we may not have covered um, already. Okay. Uh, somebody's put up a question there to say, just to clarify, is there anything that the £995 course fee does not cover that will be required to complete it? So for people doing their budgets, what do they have to budget for? Yeah, so it's the, the 995 um, will cover everything in terms of uh, joining the course, the exams, all of the IRM supporting documents. Um, the only cost on top of that will be to get the two textbooks, um, as mentioned in the previous slide. So um, the, the textbooks will be available again as, a, as an e-book, or you can buy the printed copy. Um, you'd be looking at around £15 for the e-book uh, e -book version and around £25 for the two books as, as printed copies. Okay, and another question about um, exam centres. Uh, obviously, we, we deal with people here who are travelling and moving around. Can I change exam centres, someone's saying, if I move countries within the study period? Uh, yes, you will be able to. There will be um, a, a deadline in place where we can no longer change the exam centre. Um, and that will be made available to you on the course calendar once you are enrolled. So you'll be able to see a full list of key dates and um, decide whether you need to, to change the centre before that date. You would just need to let us know at the IRM um, and we can arrange for that to, to happen. I think there's, there's going to be more opportunities to take this exam, aren't there? We're, we're hoping to be running it more times in a year than we, we have been, been able to do for our, our general risk management one. So, Somebody else is asking, um, uh, is the outline of the six units that um, Trudy ran through listed somewhere? And the answer is yes. It's um, the, the full syllabus is um, on the website, so you can download that document, um, read through it, and see in a, you know, in a lot more detail exactly what is covered in each of the six units. Um, anything else that uh, anybody would like to add on that? So I, think, I think that's all the questions that, that we've got that are coming through on that. Um, we do have a question. Um, Stefano, are you still on the line? Yes, indeed, Karin. Okay, we have a, a specific, somebody's asking specifically to Stefano here. So, ah, okay, <laughs> right. okay. Thank you. What, it, what in your opinion are the key skill sets required to effectively manage di digital risk uh, within the perspective of, of a business and its overall strategy? So what sort of key skill sets um, are needed for digital risk? Okay, uh, let's distinguish technical from, uh, uh, say, behavioral competencies. Uh, from the technical part, definitely analytical skills, having uh, uh, no knowledge of uh, basic knowledge, I would say, of system programs, uh, but not as, not being a technician, definitely uh, having uh, definitely at ease, being at ease with uh, with. Um, uh, uh, basically financial analysis and uh, all what concern uh, the understanding of risk, so background uh, on risk. And uh, well, they're asking me also business, right? So I mean, in terms of business, uh, being uh, definitely uh, having a, a strategic, uh, also strategic uh, uh, understanding of what is strategy and how to define uh, planning of, uh, of business, uh, uh, say, uh, business uh, uh, venture, business opportunities. I would stress the behavioral part. I think it's very important, and I think uh, my, uh, my other colleagues in the panel mentioned the importance of being up to date with all the technology. So having this part of, of uh, um, uh, IT, uh, well, I would say not more IT, but I think I really um, being at, um, up to date on, uh, on the evolution of uh, the technology. I think it's important also to have flexibility and, uh, and uh, flexibility in adapting to different uh, environments that are not, not the more traditional environment, but more digitalized environment. And I think uh, strategic thinking also very important, uh, a scenario forward looking. So I think uh, in that respect, uh, uh, 
uh, I would say that uh, the, this, this, the, sub, the set of uh, soft skills uh, it's richer, it's higher than, than the traditional one. I've been discussing this re just recently with HR expert, and uh, they've been mentioning that they are looking, uh, for example, no more in the accounting side. I mentioned the accounting because it looks like in the accounting side that just the basic being a specialist of accounting, but also having a digital background. For, for what concerns the RPA, the robotic uh, press process automation. So also for that respect, the accounting job is evolving. So that also is valid for business and strategic uh, profiles. So the evolution has to be, uh, uh, say, integral, comprehensive, both from the technical and from the behavioral part. Thanks, Stefano. I think that gives people a lot to think about, both in terms of their own skill development and also people who are employing other risk professionals and how they go about um, doing job descriptions and looking at training and development going forward. I'm okay. working, Caroline, just uh, for, the, for the audience, I'm working, for example, on a chief uh, digital risk officer, new profile. So wow. at top level also, uh, look for, uh, for the new, you know, for the new uh, organization that are more fintech or anyway technologically oriented, uh, it's no more uh, necessary to have a chief risk officer, but also a chief digital risk officer. So that, so that, to, so to say, that has uh, this broader um, uh, background. Uh, and it's difficult at the moment, uh, as far as I can see, but um, I may have a limited experience in that respect, but uh, it's difficult to find a chief, chief risk officer with that set, such set of, uh, of skills. But I'm, I'm, I believe it's evolving. The market is evolving, and I think this is coming. Definitely, DROs are already available. So I think these DROs could evolve into a more a top executive level. Great. OK. Well, this is certainly the way of the future, isn't it? Is now, the future. We, have, we have a couple of just, um, practical questions about the examinations here. Um, there's a question about how many questions are there in the exam? And also, is it just multiple choice questions with no essay-based questions? So which one of you would like to answer uh, that? Trudy will take that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are 60 questions um, in the examination. And it is only um, assessed by multiple choice questions, although there are different types of multiple choice questions that will appear in the examination. No essay-based questions. OK, so that's fine. And then there's a, a technical question. Um, uh, do you have a centre in West Africa? And if not, how will I do my exam? So, um, James, do you want to talk about the geographical uh, approach to exams? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, exam centres are available throughout the world. So, as a distance learning course, uh, I think Carrie mentioned earlier, we have been running distance learning courses for a number of years. Um, we have many international students across the world. Um, we deliver courses um, or, or let students sit their exams anywhere that they're located. So there will definitely be um, an exam centre near you. Um, I think, like I said before, we will be contacting students once they're, once they're enrolled to let them know what the exam booking process is and how they select um, a local exam centre to them. So I think the answer is yes, there will be many centres in West yeah, Africa, yeah, so uh, that will be no problem. OK. Um, we have a question about a student saying, it says, um, can a student who's registered, I think they mean for the International Certificate in Risk Management, substitute for the Digital Risk Management Certificate? Um, they are completely separate qualifications. Um, our International Certificate in Risk Management is, is uh, twice the size of this um, Digital Risk Management qualification, um, and that allows you to uh, sort of climb the ladder within IRM. The Digital Risk Certificate is a standalone supplementary qualification that can be taken by itself. Um, and it can be either taken as a, a, you can then go on and take the international certificate if you want to take that, or you can take the international certificate and then take the digital one as a, as a supplementary of you know, some of your lifelong learning uh, and CPD. So that's how those two work together. Um, there's a, a, co a question here about the timing of the course. Can I join the course in March 2019, but register for an exam later in March 2020, not November 2019? I, can I take longer to prepare for it? Um, Trudy, would you like to sort of explain the, how that's going to work? Well, basically, how it's designed is there's four enrollment periods. 
um, in each year. And the course is designed to take nine months from the end of each closing point. So, uh, James, that's correct, isn't it? That there are, you know, we have um, cycles of three monthly enrollment periods and the exam is then nine months following the end. So effectively, it's around the year anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And um, specifically for this question, I guess, um, looking at uh, the exam sessions and the enrollment sessions, um, nothing has been confirmed in terms of dates, but we have a rough idea of when the future enrollment periods will be running. Um, and to give you an example, for the March 2020 exams, um, we would be looking at starting enrollments around March 2019. Um, so that will be a year in advance, but you won't begin the studying um, officially in terms of the support from the module coaches and, and the tutorials and the webinars until around May. So you're getting that nine-month period to, to fit those 200 hours of study in. And we have another question here about, effectively, what are the terms and conditions associated with the introductory price? Um, if you sign up at the introductory price, do you have to take the exam in 2019, and what will happen then? Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, the, the enrollment periods relate to a specific exam period. Um, so, for example, the one we're in at the moment, up until the 28th of February, is specifically for the November 2019 exam session. Um, so you wouldn't be able to move or defer your date. Um, you would be looking at the enrollment period and when the exam is in, re in relation to that, and whether that's a, an exam that you can commit to. Um, if for, for example, you weren't able to commit to a November 19 exam, um, you would potentially then be looking at one of the future enrollment periods that we'll be announcing early next year. Okay. And Trudy, you mentioned earlier that um, it was 60 multiple choice questions, but that there were different sorts of multiple choice questions. Now, this has obviously sparked some interest. What, what, sort of, what do you mean by different sorts of multiple choice questions? Well, they will all require one correct response. Um, but they will be different formats of multiple choice. So some of them will be in the in the sort of like reason and assertion ones, which are like statement questions mm -hmm. where they have to answer if both statements are correct, or if only one statement is correct, or if one statement leads to the other. Um, some will be standard, straightforward, multiple choice um, so factual questions, ones, which yeah, is so factual, factual with yeah. one mm -hmm. correct response out of three. And some will be attached to case studies where they will have to use information in the case study to arrive at their answer. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, will only mm -hmm. be one correct response. Yeah. So I think um, multiple choice assessment is quite sophisticated mm -hmm. when you, and uh, you know, it has been used successfully for many professions around the world, hasn't it? Definitely. So it's not simply a matter of learning facts and regurgitating them. We're not actually testing understanding as well. And application of knowledge. OK. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, I think that is probably uh, all we've got time for at the moment. Um, thank you very much to everybody who's been sending their questions in. We've got a, a lot. Um, <clears throat> if, we, if there are any more questions, then um, please do either look on the website where there is a lot of information listed, um, or if you'd like to get in touch with our um, our inquiries team here at IRM with specific questions. Um, that, you know, particularly if they relate to your personal situation, um, then they'll be very happy to deal with them. Um, so thank you very much to all our speakers for joining us here today. Thank you to the three Steves from uh, various parts of the world who have signed in um, and uh, given us the benefit of your, uh, your knowledge about that, that, this digital world. Um, don't forget, thank you. You, can, you can access you. a recording of this webinar through the Bright Talk system um, if you either want to listen to it all over again or perhaps if you'd like to recommend it to a colleague and pass it on to a colleague so that they can listen to it. So thank you very much to everybody for joining us here today. And uh, we hope that we will be welcoming you as students of our Digital Risk Certificate very soon. So thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>